All right. That's my cue. That's Chris's cue. <laughs> Good morning again, everybody. This is Spax Attack. Spencer Israel, Chris Catchy with you as always, running through the biggest headlines, rumors, uh, and movers and shakers in the world of Spax. Chris, how's it going today? It's going great. How about you, Spencer? Chaos, man. Chaos is the name <laughs> of the game. So as Ryan just mentioned, uh, our, our guest today, this is interesting. I don't know if, uh, have you guys spoken to a hedge fund uh, PM before? So we've done um, Accelerate Funds, which is some ETFs in Canada, the manager of that. But yeah. we have not gotten into the hedge fund side of things as much here. It's going to be good. So yeah, Chris DeMuth Jr., he's the uh, PM portfolio manager at uh, Wrangley Capital that'll be on uh, a little bit later in the show. Until then, let's do some headlines. Chris, you ready? Absolutely. All right. All right, guys. So diving into headlines up first, um, we have RBAC, so Red Ball Acquisition Corp. Uh, shares were actually halted not too long ago. Um, they are unhalted now. Shares did spike up. Um, I'm not seeing any hard rumors out there. Um, remember, this was the one linked to Fenway Sports, um, the Red Sox, and Liverpool. But those talks ended, so now they're searching for another target. Um, I will throw out that I have seen you know, some unconfirmed firmed rumors um, of Sport Radar, a sports data provider to sports betting companies. Um, so we'll be monitoring this throughout the show till noon today. Um, maybe we get some more uh, rumors from a better source or we get a breaking news announcement during the show. We did have three deals announced yesterday um, before open as part of what we now know in SPAC land as Merger Monday. So those shares yesterday, ARYA was up 100%. SNPR was up 33%. And GHVI up 10%. So ARYA, the big gainer, up 100%. Um, but all three were up. Uh, I haven't seen the last two Mondays when we got those six and seven deal announcements. We did have a couple that actually fell on the day um, because of that built-in premium that was already there and the market reaction to those deal announcements. So looked like positive reaction yesterday to all three deals, um, but we'll keep an eye on those as, again, we look for some entry points um, you know, post announcement here. Um, and then uh, open. So former SPAC, um, open door, O-P-E-N from Chamath Palihapitiya. Got some positive news um, in the analyst front. So Oppenheimer reiterated a buy rating, raised the price target to $34. And then I'm seeing that Loop Ventures, so Gene Monster, also out with a very favorable report of both Zillow and open door. Um, disrupting the housing market going forward. Um, also notable that Kathy Wood bought shares of Open uh, prior to that merger close when they were IPOB, and she was actually selling shares of Zillow um, in the process. So it looks like she favors, um, you know, Open Door, but it looks like you know Loop Ventures making the case for both, disrupting the housing market. Um, so definitely keep an eye on Open Door going forward. And then speaking of Kathy Wood. We have DraftKings and EXPC, which is taking Blade public. So ARC added to both of those positions yesterday, added 272,900 shares of DraftKings in ARC F and 229,500 shares in ARC W. First took a stake last week, and I predicted that she will keep accumulating. Um, so part of the ARC management team was out with a very bullish note on the growth of sports uh, betting. So ahead of most analysts, where most analysts see a 15 to $20 billion addressable market, um, the ARC uh, fund person who spoke actually said $37 billion by 2025, and that sports betting could be worth $180 billion someday. So DraftKings, you know, kind of the market leader, they're in more states than anyone else for online sports betting. So not a big surprise, um, you know, that that's where Kathy Wood put her money first, but definitely keep an eye on DraftKings. Uh, Metro Mile, their merger with uh, Insu Acquisition Corp. 2, INSU, was approved. Uh, we'll start trading as M-I-L-E as early as tomorrow. 
this is a pay per mile insurance company. And I want to keep an eye on this one. Again, this is a uh, Chamath uh, pipe deal. Also has backing from Mark Cuban. And then they also added Ryan Graves, former Uber um, veteran. So strong management team here trying to disrupt the insurance market. Um, you know, so definitely keep an eye out on that one once we start trading under that new ticker. A couple of big movers yesterday were LGVW up 18%. And STPK up 16%. So LGVW, of course, uh, nearing that vote date this week, um, backed by Bill Gates, Bailey Gifford, also part of ARC Funds ETFs. Um, so that's another one to keep an eye on this week. It has been a high flyer. Um, we'll see if the trend continues of these SPACs trading down after the merger vote, or if Longview is one of those exceptions, you know, where it takes off right away. As it transitions to that new uh, ticker of BFLY, um, so keep an eye out on that one. An IPV, um, I heard him talk about this one on pre-market prep this morning, taking LIDAR company AVA public. Big mover, uh, shares up 8% last I looked today. They were featured on Mad Money yesterday. Um, so, of course, getting that Kramer bump when he mentions or talks to management teams from SPACs. So as I said yesterday, as someone asked, there are quite a few LIDAR plays now entering the public markets thanks to SPACs. Um, so it's very difficult right now to see who the market leaders are and who have those great deals with the uh, auto companies. So keep an eye out on all of those, but IPV moving um, you know, with that Kramer bump. A couple of rumors yesterday, NGAC. Uh, Reuters reporting that they're nearing a deal with XOS Trucks. Um, shares were up 29% yesterday. We actually talked about this one on the 3 o'clock portion of the Benzinga show, um, as that was kind of breaking news at the moment. And then Chinese electric vehicle company Baitan is exploring a SPAC deal. company is backed by Apple partner Foxconn. Reuters reports this, but no tickers were mentioned in that article. But again, more and more electric vehicles hitting the public market via SPAC. A couple new SPACs launching today as units to make sure everyone is aware of. Um, so we have SPAQU. This is the third SPAC from the Apollo Group. So their first two done were Fisker and then Sunlight Financial, uh, SPRQ, um, which we'll be talking to the management team of that company tomorrow. That was another Chamath pipe deal. Then PICCU is a new SPAC from Jonathan Ledecky. So that PIC line of SPACs did deals for KL Discovery and also XL Fleet, ticker XL. Ledecky is also a member of the Northern Star SPAC team that did the BarkBox deal and has other SPACs coming. Uh, targeting uh, logistics, last mile delivery, technology, cybersecurity, uh, media, entertainment, or franchises, so a wide range of target areas, but Jonathan Ledecky um, quickly shaping up to be um, one of the top SPAC names out there as far as volume. And then ENNVU, uh, another new SPAC targeting sustainability, uh, will launch today. And then a couple deals to get into before our guests today. Uh, so after close yesterday, we had a deal announced of GRNV. Um, this is uh, Hellbiz, which is a technology company with micro mobility solutions. So they see revenue of $4 million in 2020, uh, $80 million in 2021, $165 million in fiscal 2022. This deal valued the company at $320 million. Uh, also of note, they said um, that they were targeting ghost kitchens as well. So, you know, as restaurants kind of pivot, to that delivery only model. Um, it looks like uh, Helbiz uh, with their scooters and micro mobility vehicles looking to get a piece of that action um, as far as deliveries go. And then our big deal announced this morning uh, DCRB. Um, this one was rumored last week, but we got that definitive agreement today. So merging with Hyzon Motors, which is a hydrogen fuel cell heavy vehicle company. They see revenue of $37 million in fiscal 2021, $198 million in fiscal 2022. A deal done at $2.1 billion includes a $400 million pipe from existing investors. Uh, Fidelity and BlackRock among those uh, the pipe investors. 
company will get $626 million in gross proceeds that they'll use to fund and accelerate their growth strategy already in place. So they already have a sales footprint and pipeline that includes several Fortune 100 companies and also uh, municipalities across the U.S. Um, so this is a pure play on mobility, uh, focusing exclusively on hydrogen um, for fleet-based and commercial vehicles. So keep an eye out on this one, see where we land today. And then, of course, our calendar. Um, we had those vote dates yesterday, uh, INAQ and PANA. We turn to the 11th this week. We have SBE voting on that merger with ChargePoint. I do own shares of SBE. Then on the 12th, we have LGVW voting on that merger with Butterfly Network. So that's what I've got for headlines and also those new deals, Spencer. A lot you just ran through there, Chris. I feel like I I just need to let that let let's just stop and let all that sink in for a minute. A lot of information today. That was very dense. Twelve, n- not even like nine minutes of of uh, of information. How, just just so everyone knows, how long does it take you to compile all that research? So I typically, you know, see notes throughout the the trading day. Yeah. Um, you know, tweets or articles, press releases. I'll set them aside, you know, as an open tab or jot it down. And then at night I go through more and then I typically, you know, put that into the document in the morning. Um, You know, so throughout, you know, a a 24 hour period for each show, you know, a couple hours of, uh, you know, research and compiling. So nothing too difficult. But again, we're trying to bring all that information from multiple sources and, you know, condense it to one place. Um, And we also have our SPAC newsletter which I will drop in the chat where we try to put um, as many of those headlines and deals as we can to get that out to, um, you know, all our viewers and readers before the show even airs. So definitely sign up for that. Just put that in the link as, or in the YouTube chat as well. All right. Our guest is here, Chris. So allow me to introduce uh, another Chris, uh, Chris Demuth Jr. Uh, He is the, uh, Founder and portfolio manager at Rangeley Capital, an event-driven hedge fund, and they are just as excited about SPACs as we are. So let's bring Chris on here now. Chris, welcome. Thanks for having me. You are in a very professional setting. You're making us look terrible, <laughs> uh, me with my wooden cutouts, but uh, how's it going today? Uh, fine, fine. I, I've mostly been working from home, but I stopped by the office to chat with you guys. We appreciate you going out of your way. Not that far. Only okay. about a mile or so walk. Oh, my goodness. Hadn't been uh, out in a while. In uh, this weather? You're walking in this weather? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's great to be here. All right. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Welcome to the show, Chris. Uh, we're going to dive into questions here. Um, you know, I know you as a writer on Seeking Alpha. I spent some time over the years writing there as well. So I'm familiar with some of your work, but um, I want to hear more about your hedge fund. So can you tell our viewers, um, you know, a little bit about that hedge fund and how SPACs kind of play into that? Sure. So I started it a little over a decade ago. Uh, we are value investors. I think we spend almost all of our time thinking about businesses that we want to invest in for the long term. Uh, we're very active in research. We're far less active in uh, in trading. Um, but we look for things where there are uh, kind of structural reasons why prices can be anomalous, where they're isn't kind of an easy uh, comp necessarily. So a lot of the things are stocks right at the periphery of the stock market where things are entering or exiting. And uh, SPACs have been part of it from the beginning. So we've followed SPACs for over a decade. I think you could have the first 90% of it without ever getting a follow-up question uh, if you said at a drinks party that you're interested in SPACs. And then out of nowhere, it's gotten to be this kind of uh, interest uh, in the pop culture. So that's uh, been a big surprise to us and new to us. Uh, I've never uh, never been one of the cool kids before, but I think uh, we're somewhere into our 15 minutes of fame in the world of SPACs. Perfect. So 
Um, there's so many SPACs to choose from now. So we're seeing, you know, record number of new SPACs issued, record number of, you know, dollars raised for SPACs. So um, what's kind of your outlook? What is it that you look for, um, you know, when you get into a SPAC? And are you buying into these SPACs pre-deal announcement? Or is this done, you know, on a deal-by-deal -deal basis? So we typically start at the very beginning. Uh, we uh, enter via the IPO and or founder shares uh, and or uh, pipe. Uh, so we generally use the primary market of interacting with the sponsor and with their underwriter uh, far less frequently uh, are we uh, buying or selling in the secondary market. Um, and we generally are looking to hold for the long term. So this is something where we will, uh, uh, if we exit, when we exit, will be kind of part of the late stages of the despacking process. Uh, and we're looking for a team that uh, we want to be uh, associated with. So we're looking for kind of private market uh, standards for uh, good stewardship. Uh, we tend to like larger SPACs better. Uh, we tend to like experienced teams better. Um, and even if they're not experienced in SPAC specifically, if they're deal experienced. So one of our uh, significant investments was in uh, Liberty's uh, SPAC. Uh, you could say they hadn't done a SPAC before, but you could also say they're probably the best, most successful M&A team in the history of corporate finance uh, with Greg Maffei's uh, deal with Sirius in 2009. We've been invested with them uh, ever since then. Uh, uh, our whole life of my hedge fund, one of our biggest, best, largest, oldest positions uh, is in Liberty uh, and their various uh, public entities. And so it was an easy decision for us to want a very significant investment in them when they did a SPAC. Uh, wait, Chris, I just have a question for you because you mentioned sure. that, that you've been you know, investing in SPACs for, for a while. Mm -hmm. Can you describe to us what the, the SPAC market has historically been like? Because I, I, I had heard of a, a blank check companies, but mm -hmm. SPAC is, is now, it's in the nomenclature, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, you, you're having your 15 minutes of fame or a little bit more so. Uh, you're at the cool kids table. Can you just describe to us what the SPAC market has historically been like? Sure. It's a little bit like the transition. If you guys watch Silicon Valley between when uh, you are uh, looking for capital or raising capital and you're in favor and the not in favor, you know, we, you go through years when people are lobbying you to invest in what they're doing. And then all of a sudden now it's me lobbying a sponsor saying, this is something I really want to invest in. And uh, it's going to be 10 times oversubscribed. And so something that used to be, um, us making a decision and it hard uh, to uh, shoo away potential sponsors is now begging the highest quality sponsors to take our money. Uh, so that's a big change. Um, and then it's gone radically up market. So the biggest, best, uh, most famous private equity firms, hedge funds, and, uh, and industries have their very top people uh, sponsoring SPACs now. Uh, so, you know, you have KKR uh, and Elliott uh, in the uh, hedge fund world You uh, and, and, and private equity world. Um, you have uh, Liberty in the corporate world. I mean, these are kind of the uh, very upper echelons of people. That wasn't nearly the case 10 years ago. So uh, this is something that's gone uh, upscale uh, and something that the balance of... Uh, of, of the conversations between capital, uh, such as mine and the sponsors has completely flipped in the past year. Can you just, like, what do you think of, and I'll, I'll let Chris take over in a second, but what do you think of the, just the amount of money being raised? I saw a stat today, it was like a billion dollars a day in 2021 mm -hmm. being raised, you know, via SPACs. I mean, what do you, what do you make of that? Well, um, if you look at the broader, market for public securities. And there's something like 70,000 investable uh, public securities that investors can choose from. Um, the SPAC process is just chipping away at a multi-decade decline in the number of securities in the public market. So you have 
immense wealth being made specifically in Silicon Valley, more generally in the venture capital and angel investing world, uh, where uh, there's not as much transparency, there's not uh, as much um, access for average people to have any kind of role whatsoever. Um, and then after uh, the VC world has made 100x, 1,000x their money, then it's kind of handed over to the general public. I think of SPACs as the 21st century uh, successor to traditional IPOs, where there was a lot of arbitrariness. They would just kind of set prices and it was, um, it was kind of fixed by high-priced helpers. SPACs, every step of the way is market-driven. Every step of the way, you have to kind of check in with the market and see what the market will uh, take. A lot of my time is spent on testing the waters calls where even before an S1, I will uh, meet with and speak with sponsors about my appetite for investing. Do I want to invest or not? Uh, what terms would be acceptable or not? Uh, how much I would want to put in. And that kind of defines how these unit structures are done, uh, not just me, other people in my role uh, versus the uh, sponsors hearing uh, our level of interest. And uh, so that's, that's a real market on um, how much capital they can raise in the IPO, uh, what deal, what deal is priced, whether they get the vote, all of these things are market driven. And I think that that's better. I think it's more efficient. I think it's faster. I think it's fairer. I think it's more open. I think it's ultimately uh, less rife with uh, corruption. But it also has all the vagaries of markets, which is uh, uh, our job is to uh, serve customers uh, with products and services they think they want. Uh, it's not the job to dictate what sectors uh, people invest in. Um, and some get very in favor for good reasons sometimes and sometimes for bad reasons. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of um, how it's gone. I mean, it's really been a sea change in the past year. Um, but some people say bubble kind of casually. I think they mean uh, something that's going up that they don't own um, as, a, as, a, as a definition. Uh, but it is only on the margins increasing the number of things that are public. And it's moving into the public markets and into uh, something that anybody can participate in. What historically has been happening, uh, happening very lucratively, but happening in the private markets. Perfect. So I heard you mention um, Liberty, and then you also talked about you know some some new players entering the the SPAC market. So KKR, Elliott, um, we've seen SoftBank now launch some SPACs. So um, you know, and this is probably a balanced approach. But how important is it to you, um, you know, for these these uh, management teams having experience doing deals before in private equity versus uh, you know SPACs? Uh, like Chamath and Michael Kleins, where they have a history of getting SPAC deals complete. So, you know, which, which do you prefer or is it just, you know, a healthy balance of the, the two kinds? Uh, it's a balance. I think there's three very distinct roles. And I know of almost nobody who's excellent at all three between operational competence, uh, asset allocation, and uh, marketing and the kind of razzle dazzle around an announcement, uh, which I take seriously. It's not my role, it's not my skill set, um, but we're in an era of earned media billionaires where uh, people like Donald Trump, people like Richard Branson, like Chamath, uh, Kathy Wood can uh, unlock immense amount of value because. They don't have to pay for a half hour ad of advertisements to get a half hour of attention on uh, Twitter or on CNBC. And so having that in the mix is part of it. Uh, having great asset allocators is part of it. And then having operational competence is part of it. Uh, I have a fairly strict hierarchy in that my first, my first interest is in operational competence uh, followed by asset allocation, very important, but once they've picked the deal, I can kind of do my own work analyzing it. And then thirdly, the marketing. Um, I'm very happy to be invested in all three types of SPACs or SPACs dominated by all three types of characters. Uh, but when I'm being locked up, when I kind of am committing to something where I'm going to be in it far after the de spacking process, that's where the steepness of my hierarchy is even steeper, that I like great operators, 
uh, sound asset allocators and if they can market and if they can uh, capture the imagination of the public, that's nice too, but that's probably third. I know this is another one where it probably varies based on the deal, but if you buy units in a SPAC, what's the approach to you know holding the common shares, the warrants? Do you hold them before the deal is announced? Do you sell any after that deal is announced if you get a good run up? So uh, good question. So we almost always, even if we're in uh, another part of the cap structure, almost always will have a significant part of the units in an IPO. My preference is to be at 10% of an offering. Uh, sometimes we're at 5%, especially if it's huge, especially if it's huge and uh uh, very hard to get in, and if it's a sponsor that kind of comes in with their own capital. So uh, we have a significant uh, investment for us uh, in Peter Thiel's uh, uh, last uh, SPAC, but it was a little smaller than maybe my optimal preference because he came in with so many fans of Thiel Capital that uh, being an outsider, it wasn't, um, it wasn't easy to get as much as I'd ideally like. Uh, so we tend to have a big position in units. Uh, we tend to split those units when you can split them typically 52 days in or so. Uh, we typically are not trading until a deal announcement uh, or doing so on rare occasions and small amounts. It's not a big part of our strategy. When the deal's announced, there are two things that we look for. One, we are very sensitive to the relative valuation between the equity and warrants. Um, because they don't serve as great diversifiers for each other, we have no reasons to add to anything other than the cheapest one or subtract from anything other than the most expensive one. Uh, typically, that has been uh, in favor of warrants versus equity. Uh, but not always. Uh, there are situations where we want equity and don't want the warrants and vice versa. Um, but, um, you know, all of our focus and attention is on the deal, on the company and thinking like business owners versus thinking like traders. But to the extent we have something to do, it would generally fall in the category of uh, lightening of the more expensive one and adding to the less expensive one if there's an anomaly between the two. And over this past year, I've written about a couple of times, there have been gaping anomalies, um, uh, most prevalently with equity being uh, far, far too expensive relative to the expensiveness of the warrants. Uh, and then secondly, uh, something we've observed and written about a bit this past year is that the implied volatility of some of these SPACs is uh, extremely high, uh, just white hot. And uh, so the ability, if there's ever a time or place, especially if something's kind of roared so that we sized it to about where we wanted it, and then we're all of a sudden massively oversized in some position, if there was ever an opportunity where we want to lighten up, we would typically buy right the equity when the equity is more expensive. So write calls against it, near-term call volatility. I mean, sometimes, you're in a situation where the premium is 10 to 20 percent uh, near term at the market. And so even if something subsequently liquidated, you're locking in a very, very good investment on part of your capital, simply writing at the money near term calls. So uh, we look at the difference between warrants and equity. Uh, we look at the difference between equity and options. I think I've seen zero situations where the options were surprisingly cheap and many situations where they're uh, quite expensive and were price sensitive in all things. So we kind of look at those possible opportunities, but for the most part, either contractually or culturally, we're starting at the beginning, we're ending at the end, doing our work on whether it's a target that we like and uh, sticking around just based on the value we place in the company more than anything happening in, in the stock market. Perfect. I want to dive into some individual SPACs. So I saw an article you did on ALUS merging mm -hmm. with clean mm -hmm. battery space. Can you kind of walk us through what drew you um, to that name and that deal? Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's uh, an investment of ours. Uh, it's something, uh, so I guess that serves as both the intro and the uh, disclosure. Um, it's, it's a very uh, interesting deal, uh, one we quite like. Uh, so this is one that launched in uh, 2019, 
Uh, it's one that uh, was launched by a great team. Uh, we like, trust, admire. Uh, so just in terms of the uh, deal quality team, um, it was it was good. It was a size that we like. Uh, this is a 210 um, uh, million dollar uh, SPAC. So it's kind of, you know, there's some tiny ones that initially kind of, uh, uh, strike me as too small to be a good fit for the public markets. This was this kind of checked the boxes as something we want to invest in. Uh, but these are uh, Dallas oil men uh, looking for a traditional energy deal by all uh, impression. Uh, the imagery they use, uh, their background, uh, everything. Um, but something to uh, mention about SPACs is the intended sector has no legal uh, wait. You can do whatever you want. Uh, you kind of uh, intimate to the market what you might want to invest in. Uh, but these guys were going to do an old energy deal. And then energy kind of collapsed in March uh, 2020. They hadn't picked a deal yet. Uh, and they pivoted to look at uh, next gen battery technology. And they kind of were part of this massive movement towards ESG. There's 40 a uh, trillion dollars that has some uh, ESG uh, elements. I mean, the biggest, the biggest change in history in terms of capital mandates has been this move to incorporate some or total ESG uh, into mandates. So it is an extremely attractive area for SPACs, and they could pivot. So when I say that these are market-driven processes. Uh, they were watching the market and they want something that's going to succeed. And so they pivoted uh, to doing a, a deal uh, that was unlike things that they'd run in their past. Uh, and they're de spacking Freyer, uh, a, uh, a clean next gen battery cell uh, company in Norway. Perfect. So one of the most talked about SPACs, um, CCIV. So mm -hmm. Churchill Capital Ford, there's the rumor out of Lucid Motors. So, um, you know, we talk risk reward on the show and I still own some shares of CCIV. I did sell some. How do you kind of weigh the the risk reward of these huge premiums um, that some of these SPACs are getting before they announce? Um, you know, are you are you looking to, to trim position? Um, how how important is that rumor? How important are rumor sources, uh, et cetera? Sure. So um, disclosure, it is a position of ours. In fact, it's our largest uh, investment, um, uh, possibly the largest or one of the largest investments we've ever made, but it is currently our largest. Um, it's one that we uh, were uh, in uh, from, uh, from the beginning uh, and are still in now. Um, it is a tension in my job in terms of how to handle something like this uh, because it, it kind of became organically uh, a hugely oversized position for us. So we split the units into equity and warrants. Um, we still own both. Uh, on the margin, though, when the stock price exploded, so did the implied volatility. So we trimmed via uh, recently writing some uh, $30 uh, uh, at the mon at the money uh, calls uh, that had just spectacularly high implied volatility. So we were well paid for that uh, to kind of kind of trend it kind of a little closer to a sensible position uh, size. Um, so that's kind of how we reacted. It's a it's an unusual circumstance, though, because for us, it's such a large position. Um, I, I think that um, it's, it's a team I like and trust, but a, a couple things I would add, uh, about it in particular, um, if there is a deal with Lucid, um, I think it's about an 80% chance that it happens. I think that, uh, it would be a great deal. Um, there's overlapping, uh, people between, uh, Churchill and Lucid, uh, there, uh, are certainly uh, preparations at Lucid, uh, publicly known uh, steps towards becoming a public company. So I think they are going to be a public company uh, this year. I think that's 95% chance. Um, if there was a problem, uh, it was kind of an unintended consequence, which is um, I think it is reasonable to assume that they would have a pipe associated a, a private investment in a public equity associated with 
a SPAC, I think it's reasonable to assume that that pipe was being marketed. And I think it's reasonable to assume that the original press on this was a market check of that potential deal. Well, the market check kind of got a little bit out of control and is maybe more successful. Uh, if the market hated it, that would have been a data point. Uh, the market loved it. Uh, the reason why I'm still only at about a four out of five that this works is that uh, if the market loves it so much, uh, we're not the only people uh, uh, looking at the same thing. So there could be other uh, SPACs that try to snatch it away. They could look at something else. Um, but I have uh, total confidence uh, in Churchill Capital's sponsors. Um, I think their backers are totally committed. I think their investors are going to stick with them. And I hope and expect uh, this is going to work. So um, if your downside is 10 and your upside is Tesla, I'm happy to commit a lot of capital at 10. That's a great comparison. And I think, you know, that's where everyone's at is, you know, is is this the next Tesla and kind of where does valuation go from here? So, um, you know, so CCIV well known with that link to Lucid. So I want to turn to maybe some undervalued uh, SPACs. So uh, any ones that you own or any picks out there of, you know, SPACs without a deal or SPACs with deals that maybe aren't getting the attention that they deserve? Sure. And no, that's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, Churchill is kind of like, I wasn't looking for a uh, topic that was going to get this much uh, uh, attention when we first invested in it. It was kind of a sleepy one at the time. Um, now it's anything but sleepy and we're kind of just letting it uh, play out. Um, I think that, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum um, in terms of, uh, of attention, you know, we invest in a lot of different SPACs. Uh, and since I have such a proclivity for kind of the big uh, sponsors and big deals, they tend to be well-known ones. Every once in a while, there's a quirky uh, little uh, uh, a little uh, security that's interesting to me that's really kind of out of the way and, and under uh, analyzed. Um, generally, if I'm dealing with very well-regarded sponsors, they tend to have the more stingy units. So, um, I'm generally interacting with people who can kind of dictate terms. So sometimes they have a equity with no uh, warrant. Sometimes they'll have a fifth of a warrant, take it or leave it. Um, but I, I equate it to my favorite local coffee shop in town. that has a big kind of angry sign that says cash only, uh, no phones, no service, no phones uh, uh, and other rules like that. And I think who can treat their customers like that? And the answer is, people with really good coffee. And so uh, the best sponsor teams generally don't have the most generous uh, units. At the other end of the spectrum, and this is kind of not uh, not, not our normal uh, situation, is one called um, Andina Acquisition Corp. A ticker is A-N-D-A-U, uh, uh, disclosure, we're long their rights. Uh, they have this right, A-N-D-A-R, and it's been super undervalued. You know, it was just kind of left for dead. Um, uh, you know, we own it. Uh, we uh, disclosed the position. I think it was at 42 cents. It's popped a little bit, but it's worth well over a dollar. Uh, and it's the right to the equity uh, after the deal's completed. Um, so it's in addition to the warrants, in addition to the equity, it's kind of an added part of that uh, cap structure. Um, they're uh, doing um, a, uh, they've announced a deal. They needed, uh, you know, a little more time than they originally uh, thought they would, but that uh, is um, an interesting part of the cap structure. It's not normally what I look to, but it was just so ignored and out of the way uh, that it really um, uh, just kind of jumped out as a as a value. So that's kind of uh, that's one um, that's one kind of uh, with it with a deal, but uh, not uh, getting really any attention. I, I haven't. I, I know it very well. I haven't seen it kind of uh, get um, uh, write-ups or anything like that. Uh, and then uh, in terms of something without a deal, um, I think that, uh, you know, ideally you're looking at the primary market. 
uh, every once in a while you kind of say, okay, well, if you don't have the opportunity to participate in an IPO, what's most IPO like out there? Uh, and then I think about this, well, the average first day pop in 2021 is 6% or so. And so can you get something for either significantly less than that for $10 and 60 cents? There's not that much out there that really is, or can you pay about 6% premium for something that's well above average uh, quality. Um, and so they say, okay, well, what can you get that is um, that that's there? And there's some there's some interesting things there. Um, I think one that I would uh, point out that says, okay, you're paying the average bump, but you get something that's much better uh, than, uh, than average. It would be, uh, one called Atlas Crest, uh, two it's the tickers ACIIU. Uh, the sponsor is a guy named Ken Amolis. Uh, he's a terrific asset allocator. Um, he's an extremely successful guy. I mean, I think that if you're not kind of directly in his orbit, he might be somewhat less promotional or less flashy, uh, than the most famous ones. Um, but he's going to do a great deal. He's somebody I have, uh, total confidence in. And so that's one that's kind of an average price for a public in the secondary market available SPAC for much higher than average, uh, average quality. Um, and, uh, so that's one that I think you know, is, 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 is really under, um, under known for how good it is. Um, and then another one I'd throw out, I think somebody said that you've had a uh, Niccolo Damasi on before, um, but he's a, a terrific SPAC sponsor. He's done, I think three so far, uh, three that I've, uh, uh, that I, uh, have been involved in it all. Um, but he's somebody that I think kind of next time he has something to say, um, uh, not to put words in his mouth, but I would be um, backing him as far as I'm able to. Uh, it is a really significant scale in terms of the quality, the uh, direction that he is likely to look and the scale of his backs. Uh, that's somebody that I would, um, if in the secondary market, somebody who's not in the IPO could get that anywhere near uh, average, um, that would be somebody worth paying up for. Yeah, that's that's great praise. We had uh, Nicolo Damasi on the show. So DMYT went public with Rush mm -hmm. Street Interactive, DMYD mm -hmm. with Genius, and then his third one, DMYI, still out there. And then also he's involved with uh, Glue Mobile, and they got that uh, acquisition announcement from EA last night. So um, he's having some some good success here. So before we wrap up, Chris, I just have one more question for you. Sure. Um, you said you've been in SPACs for for years, so but they really came into favor over the last couple. My question is, what former SPACs, um, you know, are still appealing? So you know, maybe Virgin Galactic, DraftKings, some like that. Are are there any that you've held for for years and years, and some that you'd like, you know, way long term here? Sure. And um, there, there's at least one, well, there's a couple of these I'm not able to discuss at all that are still uh, significant investments of ours. Uh, but of the ones that we're able to uh, discuss, um, I would throw out, I, I've written about uh, Virgin Galactic recently. I thought that that was a very interesting one. It was the post de equity with the highest uh, short interest, um, even if some of the short thesis could eventually be uh, borne out. I thought it was an extremely dangerous uh, short. Um, and uh, I kind of had a, I had a fairly lengthy uh, caveat section that kind of uh, deferred to many of the short thesis ideas. But in uh, January, uh, I wrote a piece called Will Virgin Galactic Go Hypersonic? And um, uh, to say, oh, sorry about the phone ringing. I don't know why. Um, but uh, uh, saying uh, that uh, if, uh, if you were short it, you should cover. Uh, so that was kind of uh, something at the time uh, we had an investment in. Uh, it was actually a case of something we had an investment in. Uh, we had calls. Uh, we had, Using the options market, we uh, have been uh, taken out of our position since then. Um, but that was certainly an interesting one. 
Um, I think that a tattooed chef is something we have a significant investment in uh, to this day um, of the post-dispact equities. I think that that is, uh, is a very promising one too. Um, and then uh, in the in the process um, of uh, 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 despacking, there's 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 a there's a few more that I think are um, interesting to me. Kind of once you move beyond the uh, uh, once you move beyond the spac part of the process, it's like owning any other equity, and it should uh, you should bring to bear all of the fundamental analysis and kind of uh, research rigor that you'd bring to owning any other equity. Uh, your downside's just gone from $10 to zero, uh, like any other stock. And uh, that should be a moment that uh, you uh, approach with a lot of gravity. All right. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Chris Smith Jr. is the portfolio manager and founder of Rangely Capital. Uh, Chris, we appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. That was, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, Chris. Man, you know it's one. It's 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 funny because Chris is is like a veteran spat guy, but yet it's as mainstream as it's become. It's, it's I still feel like it's such a niche space. You know what I mean? So there, I don't know how many other Chris's, like like how many more people are there like Chris who who have been in the game for 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 years. I, I don't know. I don't know how how many there are. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I love hearing is, you know, what was your first SPAC? When did when did you get interested? And, you know, you see a lot of times, you know, people start with Virgin Galactic, you know, a couple of years ago, or it was DraftKings last summer, yeah. or it was, you know, Hylian or Nicola, you know, where, where was your entry point into when SPAC started becoming so popular? So, you know, uh, Chris has got years of experience in that industry. You know, I loved hearing the insight there from him. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, my entry, my the first time I ever heard of SPAC refers in, to uh, to Nicola. Prior to that, it was a blank blank check company, right? It is is how it was referred to. Um, but yeah, it's just that, that that was that was that was great stuff. We, we'll have to get get Chris back, and and next time maybe I would like to talk more history and just I want to know what the SPAC market was like ten years ago. You know what I mean? Because it was uh, it was it, it was much much more of a shadowy corner. Of, of Wall Street than than it, it is now. All right, uh, eleven forty eight, Chris. We got about twelve minutes or so left. Let's do some questions from our chat. We'll do some ticker time. So if you have a ticker on your mind, drop it in. We will do our best to take a look. And uh, if it's not a SPAC, well, that doesn't mean we don't have an opinion, but uh, try to keep it SPAC related. This is SPAC's attack after all. All right, let's start. They are flying. Chris Kachi, let's go with NGA, Northern Genesis Acquisition. Yeah, so NGA, Lion Electric. Um, this is a SPAC I still own. We had the management team on the show um, you know, the, the catalyst for me here is they're going to make their announcement of where their U.S. plant is going to be located. Um, Michigan's one of the three finalists. Um, I think when they make that announcement and really start to get everything in line, um, this could start moving higher again. Um, but to me, it's the electric buses, electric van story. And I think that's uh, very in favor with the new administration. So uh, I'm still holding shares of uh, NGA here. All right, moving right along. Uh, STPK, I feel like we discussed that yesterday. Maybe we didn't, but it feels like we did. Did we? We know. did, and that one's moving okay. again today. You know, battery play, uh, you know, clean energy, very, very favorable right now and getting lots of uh, swings higher. So definitely on the radar, but, you know, um, I would be looking for uh, dips at this point as it's been a runner. What about PDAC, Peridot or Peridot acquisition? Yep. So uh, this is one we've talked about before in the clean energy space. Uh, Jonathan Silver from Plug Power um, is one of the directors of this. I believe someone from uh, Centerpoint Energy also involved. So very strong management team. Um, it is trading at a decent size premium right now, over 13. Um, but that, that clean energy space and sustainability um, is, is a huge market going forward. So um, it'll depend on what they land for a deal, but definitely love the management team here. What do you know about SV Spring Valley? 
Yeah, so SV is one. Um, I think Mitch actually has brought up a couple times on the show too, uh, and he's in. Um, you know, it's another sustainability play. Um, you know, so it definitely on watch. I would have loved to get this one under eleven before. Um, I think we brought it up on a clean energy show that we did. It has been going higher now, um, but good management team, good target area. So definitely on watch. This is a new one for me. They're, they're all new ones for me here. Uh, NHIC. You know that one? New home? NAIC? NHIC. NHIC. Um, I do not know this one. The right. New Hold Investment. Um, I, yeah, I am not familiar with this one at all. All right. We stumped him, ladies stumped and gentlemen. Him. We stumped him. Yes. Awesome. Will, we will jot that one down and we will uh, wait, come back wait, to that who, one. Again. Okay. Uh, Whose comment was that? Vidya, Vidya, uh, email us. Uh, why don't you email? Uh, whose email do we get? Why don't you just email uh, pre market? I'll just, well, we'll make our own email. But for now, email uh, email pre market at benzinga.com, Vidya. We will get you hooked up with some swag for that because you stumped the man. That was awesome. All right. Um, moving on here. IPOD. I mean, yeah, so IPOD, one. I I own shares of this. This is a oh. Chamath one. Um, I, you know, my my guess is either IPOD or IPOF goes after a battery play here. Um, Chamath has been tweeting now about batteries, um, and how that has been his big focus um, going forward. So there's a lot of privately traded battery companies, including one that's working on a five minute um, full charge system. So keep an eye on IPOD and IPOF because I, you know, battery plays have been hot, and I think that's going to be Chamath's next announcement. Um, APXT, this one is post merger, right? Um, not quite. So this is Aspoint. Oh, yeah. Point. Okay. Um, merger should be coming anytime. This is a Microsoft partner. We had the CEO of Avpoint on. You know, th- this is one of Microsoft's largest partners in that that cloud, um, you know, space. And if you paid attention to Microsoft's earnings report, cloud was the story there. And that's what drove their growth. So, you know, I think Avpoint's going to be able to, to piggyback off of that. And they're the bridge um, between Microsoft and small to biz- medium businesses. So I, I see a strong potential here. Uh, is there news on, on Ajax? Is that, wait, let me make sure I got that right. Oh my gosh, there's so many tickers. And now I'm, I lost my place in the chat. No. Uh, I, I have not seen any news on Ajax. This is one that I own. One of the best management teams, in my opinion, out there. You have the founder of Square, the founder of 23andMe, the founder of Chipotle, and the founder of Instagram. That that's a that's a strong team, in my opinion. I think they get a great deal, and I think they're all you know itching to uh, you know help lead a company in the growth phase going forward. So I do own shares of Ajax, but I have not seen any news on that one. Uh, NGAC, uh, we discussed this, I believe, yesterday. Uh, had a bit of a volatile day. Yep. So NGAC is that rumor with XOS Trucks. We talked about that one on that three o'clock show um, yesterday, Spencer. So uh, that rumor's from Reuters. So they've been pretty spot on um, with those rumors. So we'll see where this one kind of lands because it did get above 14 yesterday. Um, but typically, when these rumors are announced, they either uh, you know, get a definitive agreement within a couple of days or otherwise we're waiting, you know, 30 days plus. So if we don't get a deal in the next couple of days, this one could sell off and provide, you know, a good entry point um, for anyone who likes that rumor um, going forward. Uh, DMYD, this one, they announced a merger, right? They they, they found their target. DMYD, yep, so DMYD uh, Genius, Genius Sports. Um, they're the data provider, the thing behind the thing for sports betting companies. Really big fan here. Um, you know, as I mentioned with RBAC, possible rumor could be Sport Radar. So Sport Radar and Genius have a duopoly, right? There's two big providers that bring this data from sporting events to the betting companies. And as we've seen the growth with sports betting, people want to bet on live sports. So they need that instant data from the games and the contests. And, you know, Genius Sports has deals in place with a lot of these sports uh, leagues. So this is one where they're going to be able to piggyback off the growth of online sports betting. 
when, when you say duopoly, let's not act like this is some huge industry. It's emerging, but it you know this isn't like some the the sports data industry isn't isn't some huge thing yet, right? I mean, not said, yet, you, but you I mean, when you when you talk about sports betting, right? You have so many players. You have DraftKings and FanDuel are like the leaders, yeah. but then you have ten to fifteen, you know, more providers um, sure. of sports betting. But when you look at the data for all those companies, you really only have two. So I think that's a good thing, um, you know, to have the duopoly there. And I don't think there's any risk of it, you know, getting broken up due to the size. So, um, you know, I, I like the entry there. What about HOL? This one's merging with a space company, right? Yep. So HOL merging with Astra, they're going to be a pure play space rocket launch company. Ooh, this one, this one, you know, pun intended, it rocketed up there right away. Um, it did dip and then it took off and it has not looked back. And as we've talked, you know, Kathy Wood, space ETFs, um, you know, Virgin Galactic, space companies everyone wants a piece of right now. And HOL, they have a platform in place where they're going to be able to move it around the country. And, you know, you can set up a launch from any area within 24 hours. Um, that's the technology they want to get to. And they're also working on satellites and some of that, you know, 5G from space technology that's been so popular. Let's do a couple more here, Chris, before we, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to remember the specs. Actually, no, Jeremiah, I'm not remembering the specs. What I'm doing is searching in Benzinga Pro. That's how good a Benzinga Pro is. It made it seem like I was remembering everything. In reality, I remember nothing. <laughs> I remember nothing. I just searched in Benzinga Pro, and there's information at my fingertips. So, no, I don't know anything. I get all my information from Benzinga Pro. Uh, let's go back here to the chat. Um, uh, what about, like, RPLA? You know, that uh, one? Re replay yep, so RPLA we had on um, Patty Cook, the CEO of Finance right. of America. This yesterday. is a mortgage play. Um, you know, the I, I like it because it's trading close to net asset value um, at 1020. So you actually have very low risk. Um, the thing I would caution is, you know, post merger, um, you know, will that one trade higher as we've unfortunately seen UWMC trade below that $10 level now um, as there's no longer a floor of 10 once the merger goes through. I really like the diversification that RPLA offers, though. It's not just a mortgage company. Um, you know, similar more to Rocket, where they're trying to grow um, different avenues and technology um, to kind of build out their business model. Uh, how would you approach VGAC? This is uh, Richard Branson, right? Yeah, so uh, 23andMe, um, this is Richard Branson SPAC. He invested in the pipe on this. Um, 23andMe co-founder also invested in the pipe. This is an interesting one because this rumor came out. And people sold it off, right? People didn't like the rumor. They they wanted nothing to do with it, you know, once that rumor came. And the big reason was uh, because this is a Virgin SPAC, everyone thought they were going to take Virgin Orbit, a space company public. Um, but instead, 23andMe was the rumor and people sold. Well, then once this deal got announced, it, it traded higher. Everyone was like, oh, just kidding. We love 23andMe. This is a gen <laughs> this is a genomics play. And then obviously when you talk genomics, you have to bring up Kathy Wood. So I guess my question would be how much of this this premium now built in is, you know, will Kathy Wood add this to her fund? And she's kind of on the fence because she criticized 23andMe a couple of years ago, um, saying that she didn't like the way they collected data and there were better companies out there. But then she has also tweeted out about how much data they have and how beneficial that could be. So to me, I think she ends up adding it eventually. But, you know, I think this one could go either way. And I think at some point, you know, it might lose investors if she doesn't add it. Uh, Chris, would you ever do one of those uh, DNA uh, testing sites, things, kits, whatever? You know, so I've never done one. Um, I've played around with like Ancestry.com where like okay. you can create your family tree, but not with, you know, sending in a DNA sample at all. Um, you know, to me, I don't know. It's one of those where like if I got it as like a gift, right, like I, I would do it. But I don't know if I would spend the money um, to, to get it. But also 
you know, as we look at family history and genomics playing into, you know, cancers and diseases down the road, um, I think that is something I would look at because you could really see, you know, hey, which test should I be getting screened for? What am I high risk for? And I think that's where 23andMe could actually be a good, you know, 10 year out bet when we really get to that point where from your DNA, you know, we can tell things like that. Yeah, I'm far too paranoid. I don't. I don't need some company knowing my genetic information. I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> not, yeah, not for me. I'm. I'm. I'm far too paranoid. I have no idea what they're going to do with that. Uh, not that anyone would be interested, you know, in my family tree. But I, I don't know. I just so know. so interesting, Spencer. Um, the yeah. thing I found out reading through their um, presentation was, and again, I mean take it with a grain of salt because, you know, who knows what they do with all the all the data. But so when you send in your DNA sample, you get the results back and then you have the option to, um, you know, opt in to that data then being collected and used for their research for, you know, uh, drugs and yeah. whatnot. Right. They said they said that 80 percent of people opt in. And I was surprised by that. I actually thought it would be lower. I thought it would be closer to 50-50. It was 80% of people that get the 23andMe kit opt to have wait, wait, you know, their, wait, I'm their sorry. stuff shared. I'm, I'm sorry. Do, do you have to – are you opt out by default and you have to opt in manually or, or, or is it the other way around? That's my understanding is when you when you do it, there's a – I I think there's a box where you have to check or you have to agree um, to have that data, you know, shared okay. with them towards their research so interesting yeah i would have assumed whatever they do automatically is 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 what most people do but because people are lazy but what do i know all right some housekeeping items on tomorrow's show we are going to be joined by matt potier ceo board member of sunlight financial ticker there is sprq did i get that right chris you did and uh yeah i own shares of this company this was a chamath pipe deal um, residential solar play. So looking forward to hearing what they have to say on, you know, having Chamath on the pipe, uh, the solar market and that new administration for uh, growth going forward. All right. You see the banner up there. Smash that like button wherever you're watching this, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube. That's right. We are everywhere. We're on every, we're even on LinkedIn. We're on every, every platform. I don't know why we're on LinkedIn, but we're on LinkedIn. Uh, all right, everyone, thank you so much for your particip participation today. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, this has been Spax Tech. Uh, Chris Cacci, you were great as usual. Thanks to our guest today, the other Chris. We appreciate him as well. We'd love to get him back. And uh, that's what I got. So, Chris, any final thoughts? That's it. We'll see everyone tomorrow. All right. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye to Chris Cacci here.